Let me tell you, uh, I already touched a lot of things, and I'm going to touch a couple of things here, but, but um, let, me, let me read one passage or three. But in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 13, uh, not 13, 3. Paul talks about his ministry, his apostolic ministry. And he says this, he says, uh, he says, uh, oh, where shall I start? I planted Apollos water, verse 6. But God gave the increase, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. I love this, the way uh, Paul does this, you know, very visual in, in some of these respects, right? We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building, okay? So, so you're a field and a building, uh, depending on what analogy we want. And, and Paul, like Jesus, uses these kinds of terms because you can't, you know, spiritual realities do not equate directly. You cannot say... Uh, the kingdom of God is like this, or I mean, is this? You have to say the kingdom of God is like this, and apply it to one dimension, one principle, one one activity, one element. And so that's why you see Paul, like Jesus, falling into this uh, this this train of thought. That wasn't what I was wanting to read. I'll keep going. But then he says this. He says, according to the the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And you know the rest. I wanted to really focus on the element of verse 10, wherein he said, he described his ministry as being the ministry of a master builder. And uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, I've, again, I, I don't take credit for anything that I've become. Uh, I, uh, I, I, if I were left to my own devices, I would be dead, okay, in a gutter somewhere. Or I'd be on, you know, a skid row in Vancouver or, or something like that. Like yourselves, I am a victim of the grace of God. Amen? <laughs> and so, so God makes us what we are. And so uh, I just want to be, be clear that anything I say about what I do or what I'm called to do, I have a very firm understanding that I could have none, done none of this. Now, like most of us, you know, at the beginning of the journey, I thought I was far more involved in this thing. <laughs> Until, you know, every, what God would do is every once in a while, he'd just back away and say, oh, yeah, you think you're doing that? Let's see who's doing that. And so all of a sudden, I, it wasn't happening anymore, and I was drying and I was dying, and I, finally I'd get to this place where I'm just about ready to keel over and, and say, God, where are you? What, what happened? And he said, yeah, well, you said, you know, you were taking all the credit, so I thought I'd let you do the work. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so through that process, we learned that without him we can do nothing. And I mean that, Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And I, uh, let me just share a little bit about that it's because it, it's opening up for me. When I was in Bible college, you know, I was doing all the stuff. I was praying for hours and hours. I was giving to the poor. I was evangelizing on the streets, and I was feeling like, Billy Graham, move over. And, uh, and uh, overnight, just like bang, God decided he was going to deal with that in me. Uh, I don't know if it was once and for all, but but he he was going to take a major blow at me, and uh, and I I couldn't do anything. All of a sudden, I couldn't read the Bible. I I couldn't hardly I I couldn't. I was in Bible college, trained to be a pastor, so I had to go to classes. Otherwise, I'd be kicked out of school. I went to classes, but everything was uninteresting to me. Uh, I uh, it was it was awful. I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up and pray. I couldn't fast. Uh, I would try to pray, and I would try to fast. I'd set my alarm. I'd, you know, hear a sermon, and I would 
stir myself up and say, okay, tomorrow I'm getting up at 5 a.m., you know, because see, you just got to decide that you're going to do these things and, and be disciplined and, you know, it's just it's just laziness on my, you know, and just, I got to push through this. I, I just got to push. And there's a, re, there's a value to learning to push. Don't make, make, but, you know, there's a point we get in our lives where we think that the pushing is everything. And that's when God says, okay, let's swing this pendulum back a little bit. And that's where I was. And so, so anyway, I set my alarm for 5 a.m. I'm going to get up and I'm going to pray, uh, th- you know, until, until the 8 o'clock class. I'll start fasting in the morning. Um, maybe I'll fast lunch too. Maybe I'm going to fast three days. I'll just, just three days I'll fast. And, um, uh, you know, around about 8 o'clock, I, I wake up and I, I, I call my roommate. Hey, did you turn off the alarm? And he said, no, no, you did. I didn't even wake up. I don't even remember the alarm. And I, so I run to class and, and miss breakfast. So I thought, okay, well, at least I'm fasting. <laughs> and, um, and my favorite meal was, um, was hamburgers at, at, at Bible College in Dallas, Texas. And, and uh, it was the only thing, the, well, it was one of the few things the cafeteria did really well. Uh, the problem with this uh, program I was on is you paid for all your food up front. And uh, and so you you know it was room and board right you had a, uh, stayed in the dorms and you get you get fed, so I'm a little Scottish, and so uh, every time I decide to fast, I'm not getting that money back, right? You know, <laughs> it's like uh, it's just it it was hard, you know, and then sure enough, the day I decide to fast, they're having hamburgers for lunch, and so I'd break my fast, and and uh, by then it's like. Oh, I can't do anything. I may as well just go to supper. <laughs> and then uh, and this was the cycle. And, and it was effectively, God said, look, without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Nothing. You can't do anything. Nothing. But, 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 but nothing. But I, mean, I, I could do that. No, nothing. Don't want you to do anything. I want you to learn how incapable you are. Because uh, I want me to get the credit for what happens in your life. And that's a lifelong journey. That doesn't stop exactly. Um, uh, Brent's through that journey, but I'm not. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, let's get back to the... Here's the problem. I uh, mean, when this atmosphere comes, when you begin to open that door, I could go... Now we could preach for hours, right? Because the knowledge of the Lord is just in the room. Everything is rich. It's, it's like when the life has come in in a dimension that I love, and now everything's alive, and there's like, there's, there's like balls of knowledge hanging everywhere. <laughs> Seriously. In the spirit, that's what it's like. Did you, did you prophetically put that up to represent that? Who did that? Who? Somebody pointed in which direction? Oh, Okay. Well done. I, I, I really like that. It, it represents something real in the realm of the Spirit. And so bless you for, uh, for uh, doing that. So as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Years ago when we started our ministry, uh, I, was, uh, I, w- I was functioning as a teacher with a, with a prophetic anointing. And a few years ago, God, through the work we were doing in Spruce Grove, God began to move me into what I call a, a building ministry, which is really apostolic. And so what happens is when I come to a church or a region, uh, I don't, I have, if you go out and you look at the tape table, I've got, uh, I don't know how many teaching series out there. I mean, there's a lot of things I can teach. And I'm currently, I've got about five books half written. I'm a great starter, not a great finisher. And, uh, and, you know, we have our television show. I mean, I've written hundreds of articles. I got a lot of things I can talk about uh, that are all, you know, good. It would edify somebody or somewhat beneficial. But uh, what has begun to happen recently is when I come into churches, um, I don't have a desire to share anything of that in particular. Instead, I come in like a superintendent onto a construction site, and I come in to see what is in place. You understand this, right? If you're taking over a project or, you know, or you're just looking at somebody else's project, you're, you know, and as builders, I, I would have been a builder in the natural if I hadn't gotten saved. Uh, you know, you just go in 
Uh, and uh, you just, I just love to see new things. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, we're driving down. And I say, oh, I wonder what that is. And Mary said, yeah, just, an, just another pile of dirt. <laughs> She's not so geared towards the construction. But, you know, you go in and you can tell what's coming by what's there. And you, you know that the next phase of construction is, uh, is relative to what's there. So you don't, you don't come in with uh, what you, a preconceived idea, unless you actually have a prophetic word. You come in apostolically with what, what's coming next. What, what is needed to be brought into place? Where, what is there in the spirit? And when I minister, I, 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 can, I can sense in the spirit foundations. I can sense where there is faith, where there is a revelation. And, uh, and you know, when there's, when there's a, a tax on a church or a region or particularly, I sense some of those things. So uh, uh, I, I'm I just saying I, I love what's happening here. Uh, some, some really good things. But I was really excited when we were pressing in and I began to see uh, that surveying angel. And you know, that's the first time I've ever seen something like that. Now, and when I say see, I'm not saying I had a vision, okay? Um, I don't know if anybody here has had a vision, but a vision biblically is, um, if you look at, at Peter, when Peter had a vision uh, or had the angel come into his, his cell to set him free, he thought he was having a vision, Okay. So imagine how real then a vision must be that, like Peter had before if he wasn't sure if he was in a vision or if it was real. Okay, that's a vision. And I know, you know, the semantics aren't, aren't critical and sometimes we use that word vision generously. But just to make it clear that when I use it, I am not saying the whole room disappeared and I saw, you know, as I see Terry here, I saw an angel standing there with a plumb line. I don't see like that. I would like to, and so if anybody wants to help me with that, uh, you know, I'd appreciate the help. Um, but uh, I, I, I see uh, with my eyes closed as I, I feel in the Spirit. And over, over the years of doing this and praying and uh, realizing that, uh, you know, it's like when you first start to prophesy and you prophesy, you feel an unction, you step out in faith and you do it and people are surprised, like, how did you know that? Then you make a note inside. Well, that, how that felt, that's what that unction feels like. And so then the next time you come to it, that you feel that unction and if, if you, you, you can acknowledge it, you think, oh, there's that unction, I'm going to go with that. And so you're able to cooperate on a in, a in a more uh, in a more free a freer and freer way as you go along, and so that's how all these things have developed for me. Okay, it's very simple, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, just stepping out in faith, not knowing, just wondering. Okay, I I think we should do this, I, you know, and then doing that thing and seeing if it actually brings uh, any life to anybody in the room or or whatever. So these are th how I've discovered these things. So when I press in on the spirit. I began to, to see uh, realms of angelic beings coming and moving. And when I saw the angel, it was like a surveyor. I thought, oh, that's so neat. I don't know if you've had a word here. A lot, most pastors have this word, you know, extend the tent of your dwelling, you know, uh, that kind of thing. It's always that classic fra uh, scripture from Isaiah uh, that most people, you know, when we're, we're God's talking about expansion, um, oftentimes it's not meant to be expansion in the natural. Oftentimes it's meant to be expansion in the spirit, that your sphere in the spirit is increasing. And uh, your, your sphere in the spirit increases, um, uh, and then the, the natural level of influence and impact you have on your region or in the, in the area of ministry that you've been called to will begin to increase. And that, that can happen for everybody, you know, whether you work in a mechanic shop or you're a carpenter on a, or whether you cook in a kitchen, you know, you have a sphere of influence that is increased uh, by the life of the Spirit as you learn to release it more and more. But particularly for this church, I saw lines being going out. And I, I got to tell you how exciting that is for me. Because, you know, this is a real kingdom. 
I, I know years ago, and I'm, I apologize for if you've sat under this and you were sort of jaded by some of this talk, but years ago, we were taught that, you know, uh, you know, you may as well rack up as much debt as you can because we want to don't leave. We don't want to leave a bunch of businesses for the Antichrist. We want to leave debt. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to let everything fall, you know, and crumble because you know, we're going. Right. And that was the attitude. I mean, I mean, some people weren't that uh, brazen about it or irresponsible. But in some cases, that was the attitude that that sort of thinking generated. It was, it was you know, we're out of here. You know, you do what you want. You know, we're just this is like Hanoi. It's all collapsing. They're coming in on every side. But we're going to get on the last copter out of here. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a terrible mindset. I mean, a doctrine of demons. It's a doctrine of demon. It's created such passivity and irresponsibility within the body of Christ. It's, it's breeded a lack of a sense of ownership in the people of God. And so contrary to what God did in previous generations. You know, even when Israel, Israel was in captivity. Jeremiah prophesied his captivity. He says, look it, I have great thoughts towards you. I have great plans towards you. And you know what he does right after that? Sends them into bondage. You know, sort of puts a new twist on the whole word faith thing, right? Right? I have great plans for you. Go with these guys in chains <laughs> to a land you don't want to go where you'll be subservient. <laughs> so what did God say? I, have, I know the plans I have toward you because, because that hope is going to need to carry you through the journey, you know, that's in front of you. It doesn't mean I'm not in this. No, I'm in this. Uh, but I have something big for you on the other end. And then when they went there, when they went to that land, they were all, okay, it's just a matter of time. We're out of here because we have a prophetic word. This is temporary. And, and Jeremiah says, no, no, no. By land. <laughs> By land. Like another, we're going to be here a while. All right? Uh, Seek the welfare of the city in which you dwell, he prophesied to them. Well, that was like, oh, really? You mean, you mean that means we're going to be here a while. But which one of these is mine? They're all nice. So, so there, uh, there has been this attitude that we just need to hold on until we get out of here. And it doesn't matter how effective and productive we are. It doesn't matter, matter that we're diminishing on every side. There's, because there's no real vision for, for taking over the land. There's no real vision for expansion. But I, the word that I see is the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. That image is what I see. And, and so I'm, I'm into digging deeper wells, wider wells, and, uh, and you are the wells that God is, is expanding. Corporately, collectively, you, you, you are that gusher that will redeem this land. You know, right when, when, uh, when, that, when that flood came in Noah's day, the flood for destruction, it mirrored another flood that would come for edification. Did you know that? What did it say about the flood of Noah? It says that the fountains of the deep were opened and the windows of heaven were open. Now, we've been praying for years, and this has been sort of the model of a, of a lot of revivalists and those of the church, and, and it's not wrong, seeking God, pray, open the heavens, open the heavens, open the heavens. And that, that is an essential element to our prayer, our ministry, our worship. That, and there's an actual, literal outcome of heavens being opened uh, while we do this. But the other part, which is equally important to flood the land, is that the fountains of the deep would be opened up. Where, where are the fountains of the deep? Where, where are they? Point. There's the fountains of the deep. Oh, look at that. My wife is pointing. I love that. Love you. She doesn't get to hear me preach that much when I'm on the road. It's great to have her here. Sorry. It's a marital moment there. Uh, the fountains of the deep... 
the fountains of the deep. That's the part that usually is missing. And so we see these sort of ebbs and flows of revival in church history where there's a, there's a rising and a falling and a rising and a falling. And, and largely, largely, uh, the, where the peaks are, it's because God says, is looking at the people with a great deal of pity, right? These people are losers, you know, I need to open the heavens or they're going to die. And so he opens the heavens and everybody, woo this is great, it's here, it's here. Uh, but that wasn't it because that's only half the equation. And this thing is not going to be finished until the fullness of the equation is there. Revival in the earth is going to be the opening of heavens, yes, but it's going to be the revival of a people. You know, Paul writes it this way. He makes this statement, and I don't know if it's just prophetic or if he actually literally meant this, but he said this. He said, man is the glory of God. Do you know that? Man is the glory of God. So, you know, we're praying, oh, God, send your glory. And, you know, there... I, don't, don't, don't get religious on me where we, we don't want to say, okay, that prayer of something coming down from above, we don't want that. No, we want that, but it has to be agreed with on earth. You, you remember that prayer of agreement? Okay, we've always said, let's hold hands. Let's make the prayer of agreement. There's higher levels of the prayer of agreement. And one of the highest levels of the prayer of agreement that God is looking for the earth is when the fountains of the deep open up as the windows of heaven are open up. Heaven and earth agree. There's an agreement. When you see that kind of agreement, then you're going to see a continuous revival. And so the plan of God is to restore you. The plan of God is to make you fully functional in the way that you ought to be. Which reminds me, I like, I like movies. Uh, they're not all uh, what they ought to be sometimes. But what happens is in the world, some creative people get a sense, you know, the, the, the creative prophetic people who aren't yet saved can feel what God is revealing in the earth. Did you know that? They can feel it. They may not interpret it correctly, and they may, you know, paint a picture or, or tell a story that's filled with their own value systems, but there are elements often, very often, that are in the storylines that mirror what God is revealing. And recently, there's this movie called Limitless, that's been released. I want to tell you that's a prophetic word over a people of God that God is raising in the earth. The people of God, the army of God, the children of God are a limitless people. You are meant to be limitless. You are meant to have something that cannot be overcome with evil. You, you have something inside of you. You have a life source that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You have something inside of you that will provide for everything that you absolutely need. Limitless is your limit. Hallelujah. Well, anyway, one of the things about that movie, when that, let me just tell you this little part because I really like this. Because I've been discovering elements of this, and you can too. This is not, you know, anointings and things that some people experience, right? It's not, you know, we, we may not all equally share in the same stuff, but we're meant to taste all of it. I want to taste of the powers of the age to come. Do you? You know, he, Hebrews, you know, he's talking about those who have fallen away. He said, those that fall away but have tasted of the power of the age to come cannot be, you know, he talks about them not, there's no, no more room for repentance. You know, we skip over that sometimes. I want to taste the powers of the age to come. That's what God wants for you, to taste the power of the age to come. Woo! Anyway, in, there's one this spot in the movie where this guy, he's just a total loser. He's like ADD. You know, he can't focus on He's supposed to be writing a book. Reminds me a lot of myself. And uh, anyway, the guy gives him this pill, and when he, he drinks, he eats the pill, swallows it, all of a sudden, it does this chemical reaction in his brain and starts to open up all the synapses. And the guy had said to him, he said, you know how it says uh, that, that we only use 20% of our brain? Well, this pill will let you use 100% of your brain. And, and it's amazing how when he takes it, all of a sudden he begins to, he's looking around the, 
He's out in the street, and all of a sudden, everything becomes clear to him. All of a sudden, he begins to take in information about his surroundings on a, a quantum level above what he could before, and he's, he's picking up everything. He's able to simultaneously analyze and, and take in the information of 100, 500 different things happening all at once. There's a bird. There's a sound. There's that guy driving. There's this little noise over here, and he's taking it all in all at once, and it all it's not creating confusion in him. He's just taking it in. That is limitless. Do you know that there is, there is a capacity in the spirit that God has meant for us to have that can take in and understand our environment in such a way that it will enable us to have dominion? That was the original plan that God had for Adam. He said, I've given you this, and I've given you everything you need to have dominion over the face of the earth. And none of that was taken away except one thing. What one thing was that? The presence of God. The presence of God was the only thing that he didn't have. You know what? Adam was actually a genius. By today's standards, there would, there would be nobody that would be equal to him in how he functioned. This movie, Limitless, is a prophetic picture of a people that are rising. It's not evolutionary. It's not, you know, a higher state of, you know, human whatever. You know, we were monkeys, we're, we're better. It's God-ordained destiny coming into our purposes. Well, he, when this guy did this, he began to not only, not only take in his environment, but all kinds of information. I mean, he, he learned piano in a couple hours. He, he was, you know, he was dating this girl, and, and he's in an Italian restaurant, and all of a sudden he's ordering in Italian, and he's having a conversation with his, the waitress, and his ex-girlfriend said, there, you speak Italian? Yeah, I learned it this week. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's obviously a science fiction movie, but it speaks of something. And not that God is there just to, to empower your brain for selfish gain, but there are capacities that we have not shared in, that we're meant to share in as sons and daughters of the king. There are attributes that we're meant to walk in and participate in uh, that we haven't yet. And you know what? The creation all around us, the fields and the trees and the air and the electrons and, 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 and the whole, the, the, the spectrum of light that surrounds us, all of the known universe is awaiting a people that would cross a threshold of agreement with the, the image of God as according to the initial pattern. And this is the plan of God. Is it, he, he said, I'm, I'm going to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. I'm going to release creation from its bondage. That's what Romans 8 talks about. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to deal with the first fruits. I'm not going to redeem the earth first. I'm going to redeem the dust of the earth out of which you were made. And that's you. But you are the first fruits of the redemption of creation. And somehow there's an intelligence within creation that's looking at you. Saying, come on, come on, come on, you could do this. And, you know, when we, I believe, I really believe this. When we start to break through those realms of the spirit and worship, and that flood begins, there was a very distinct moment when I began to feel that momentum. Remember, have you ever, uh, in the summer, every summer, we fill up, I think most summers, we fill up this uh, pool, and uh, a couple times a summer I have to drain it. And so I don't want that going into the basement or anything. So I run a hose from there out to the street, and I do the siphon thing, right? So you go, <laughs> you know, I usually end up getting a bunch in my mouth. But, but there's a point where you get when you're trying to siphon, where you feel the momentum of that, that thing established. You know, and then you can put it down. You know, it's just going to, you know, as long as the other end stays in the water, it's, the whole thing's going to drain. That threshold of momentum that you, you felt there. In the spirit, when we're worshiping, there's a threshold of momentum that you cross over, and all of a sudden, you know, it's just flowing. And, and I tell you, when, I, when we get in worship, that's what I'm looking for. That's my threshold. That's what, that's what I'm waiting for. I don't feel like we've done anything until we get that. And, then, and, uh, and that's the beginning of doing the work, though. 
In, in my mind, worship, that's the beginning of the work. And that's why this whole model of, uh, you know, well, we just want to create a presence of God. And we just, you know, it's, I don't know how to equate it. But it's like, uh, you know, we want to, ex- we, we don't want to do the work. We want to experience the blessing. It's like, you know, we don't want to water the garden. We want to be the garden. But somehow we can't just turn it on ourselves. So we, we, we you know, stick in the air. We run underneath it. We want to. Oh, this is so great. Okay, worship a little more. And so there's always this receiving uh, posture that we have. But really, children of the king are meant to do the work of the kingdom. And children play while work is being done. But adults do the work. And the work of the kingdom is to release the presence of God in the land to such a degree that it begins to touch the atmosphere in the city in which you dwell. But more than that... Till it begins to meet the need of creation. Creation is waiting. Look, I, we, we see. I don't know if creation talks that way, but cre- obviously creation, if it's yearning, it knows on some level. It has some kind of intuitive knowledge. So it knows, and it's waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. It's looking at you. And when we cross that threshold and, and the water of life begins to come, you know, there's a place in your worship, where you get that that's, that's the life right there. I love to pray in tongues. You know why I love to pray in tongues? Because it edifies me. It's not work. It's not religious service. It, I pray in tongues so that I get a, because I feel that current coming out of me and through me. And it, it is for my environment, and it is for me, but it's a river of living water. And even though I'm, I'm, I'm pouring it out in ministry when I preach or sing or whatever it is, it, it may be for others, but, but I, I get fed by the activity of it alone. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he said to the disciples at the, with the woman at the well, he said, I have food to eat you don't know. My food is to do the will of the Father. Does that make sense? Okay, I feel like I lost some of you right there. Satrakita Vanessa. Church is going to be different. We are here to redeem the land. We are, we are here to establish the kingdom. We are here to worship until the angels of God are free to come into a region. You know, I don't want to go into this too much, but there was a time when Jesus talked about uh, he withdrew from Judea because they were trying to kill him. Then he heard that Lazarus was sick, and he waited, and his disciples thought, well, yeah, we're not going back there. They were trying to kill us. But he waited, and then when uh, Lazarus was suitably dead, he, he said, okay, let's go. And the disciples, right, whoa, whoa, whoa. They, they sought to kill you. He says, are there now 12 hours in the day? What do, you, what do you mean? Other than, yeah, there's 12 hours in the day. What does that have to do with Lazarus and them trying to kill you? He said, there is a change of atmosphere in Judea. How did he know? What did he see? What did he feel? Okay. You may, let me tie this in quickly, and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll tie this up. Elisha said this. He said, uh, there are more with us than there are with them. Okay, so we don't have to worry about these armies. Now, if our armies weren't here and theirs were here, then we should leave. Okay, that's what Jesus would say. Let's get out of Judea because whatever's happened, there are dynamics that make for an infusion, a release of the hosts of heaven. And there are dynamics that make, uh, make for the retreat of the hosts of heaven. So when Jesus knew it was safe to go back into Judea is because he heard the sound of a marching in the mulberry trees. You know where that comes from, right? The sound of marching. <laughs> Holy man. Did I lose everybody? The sound of the marching in mulberry trees. When David was going to war, the Lord said, go at this spot, wait there, wait till you hear the sound of, it says in the King James, of a going in, in the mulberry trees. What is the sound of a going? That's the King James. The New King James says the sound of marching. Why? Because when I go before you, the hosts of heaven come with me, then you go into battle and you'll have success. 
Everything that we do, everything Jesus did in ministry was in step with something that was happening in the realm of the Spirit. Now, what we have is what we do in worship. When we worship, we create an atmosphere that makes it possible for angels to move. I mean, this is a real military conquest. Angels can't just go wherever. Do you know that? Otherwise, that angel would never have wrestled with Daniel. But he wrestled. He went in, and the prince of Persia met him. Right? And so they had to send reinforcements. I mean, this is real. This has really happened. So the question is, uh, who decides? Like, if God knows, why didn't he send reinforcements first? Right? Did God not know? Of course he did. But he is working with partners who don't know much. <laughs> we are the partners. We, we, are, we send in the requisition for angels. We make the way ready. We, we prepare the ground. We have to bring the agreement on earth as it is heaven. Then it starts to happen. And for generations, we've had, we've had people that have, we've been so incomplete in our knowledge, so incomplete of our understanding, we don't know how to cooperate with the way God works. So it's this shotgun, hit and miss approach. We try this, try that. Oh, Promise Keepers is working. Oh, this is working. Let's do a, a banquet. Let's, uh, that song is really anointed. Uh, let's sing that song. It's all hit and miss. Try this, try that. And there's nothing wrong with any of those initiatives, but we want to move out of knowledge. We want to move out of understanding. There is a people coming in the earth who will plant their feet in any place of land where they're called, and they'll begin to open their mouths with authority, and the kingdom of God will come here, no matter where they are, because they understand what releases creation. They understand what releases the angels. They understand what draws the favor of God to the earth. When he said prepare the way, he wants to come, but he needs a preparation. When the preparation is not there, he don't come. Let me share one last little thing, and then I'll, I'll read a scripture. <laughs> How much time? What time is it? Is the food burning? Uh, we had the Queen of England come to Alberta. And one of the guys in my church was working in a department where they were preparing some things for the Queen's coming. And he was showing me, uh, he, he worked in the sign department but next door. They had a carpentry department. They were making these chairs. And he was talking about all the things that they're, they're doing. Is he worked for the provincial government for the Queen to come. He says, uh, he starts telling me some things. I thought, what? Really? He says, oh, yeah. You should see the chairs they're making. And they went in the, room, the other room, and, and he points to a book. On the shelf, I mean, he says, that there's the, uh, what do you call it with all the details of the specifications? There, the, in the books, the, there's the documentation for the specification of the chairs that we may or may not use. We're building 25 of these at a cost of about 1000 a apiece. They're handmade, you know, they're all, and these very specific specifications, height, width, you know, cushion, padding, colors. <laughs> it's unreal. It's like, I'm saying, what? Really? He says, oh, yeah, you wouldn't believe all the things. And as he started to unfold this, I started to think about this. Here you had, in preparation for this monarch, this earthly monarch to come, you had entourages of visitors coming from England, faxing, sending documentation first, saying, prepare the way. Prepare the way. Make ready the way. Here's all the specifications. And so, you know, I mean, reams and reams and reams, protocols, details, training. Your people have to do this. They have to be trained. And then before the queen comes, we, we send entourages of more important people evaluating as to whether the preparations have been done satisfactory. That is for an earthly monarch. And we are the ones preparing for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we take this haphazard approach of, well, you know, if we just do this, and then he'll come. Well, He's God. He's God. He's merciful when we are ignorant. He bears with our, our foolishness and our unbelief and our lack of vision and our childishness. He is patient and long-suffering. Yeah, he... he you know, and we don't have to ever feel condemned for being immature unless we're 50 years old. <laughs> you know, 
Like, you know, as long as we're making progress, that's, that's the point. But we make no, no, make, make no mistake about it. There is a requirement of knowledge, of understanding. There is an actual preparation in the same way. The queen is just not, you know, I think I'm going to book some tickets for the weekend. Let's pop over to Toronto. <laughs> no, this is, this is, this is a, a long time coming. More than 2,000 years. More than 2,000 years, the church mandated with preparing the way. And that's what we are entering into. This is far above all the things. You know, it's not that the things that matter to our lives don't matter. You know what I mean? It's not that God doesn't want to minister to where we are, but he's trying to look at, I got everything I need to satisfy that, but I want to get you to the place where you're not so self-absorbed about what's matter with your life and start to take care of what matters to me. That's, what, that's the people I'm really looking for. I'm looking for sons. And by sons, I mean sons and daughters, right? All right? What are sons? What are sons? There's a condition of maturity where there is a, an agreement with the knowledge and the stature of Christ. There's a fullness to these people that causes them to function in a way that agrees with heaven. That's where we're going. Limitless. Limitless. Hallelujah. Do you have something to share or are you just on the edge of your seat because you like what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> we often will do some trading, you know. But but uh, I won't go to that other scripture. I was going to read about, uh, uh, just for your reference, Genesis 28. Jacob comes across this place. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And so he says, this is the house of God. The house of God should be the place where angels ascend and descend. Hello? The house of God should be a place where others come in and say, how awesome is this place? And they acknowledge very quickly there is an energy, if nothing else, an energy from God, even if they don't understand. What is this? This, this is powerful. If... If we're functioning as the house of God, there should be a gate, an access way to another realm. The gate of heaven is the house of God. Okay, that's where we're going. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for their journey. I thank you for what you're building here, Lord. I pray, uh, I affirm, Lord, those things that are in place. I affirm the faith. I affirm the journey. And I say, Father, let there be no hindrances. Father, let there be nothing, God, that causes so deep a frustration that we abandon the journey. God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would acknowledge to, to begin with that everything necessary for life and godliness is provided in the knowledge of you. It's here it's now we have possession of it thank you lord amen and so bless you thanks for having me here